welcome everyone to this uh, penultimate yeah. development yeah. seminar. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks for, thanks for being here. I'm really happy to be able to introduce um, Clemens Mayer um, from the uh, Central for Agamemnon Schwarzenegger in Berlin. Yes. Um, and he's worked extensively in <laughs> semantics and pragmatics, um, currently doing a lot of work on questions um, and uh, implicatives um, and sort of entailments. And today he's presenting some uh, joint work, which um, he's going to tell us more details, um, on the parallels and differences between at least Okay. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is joint work with Marie Christine Meyer. Um, we're not related. Uh, uh, and I was ho so I, I, I'm not quite sure how 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 much semantics background there is here. Uh, so I was hoping to 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 make things a bit simpler uh, for this presentation, but uh, due to the fact that I was ill for two weeks, I was not really able to, to do that. So that means I will try to, to, to go slowly and probably not go through the whole talk, actually, uh, so that uh, at least I can, what, what I present can get across. But it also means that if you have any questions uh, of understanding in between that uh, are that you feel are necessary that you, you need an answer to necessarily, please interrupt me. Right? Okay. So I will talk about at least and more than and and, and in speci specifically at least and more than as uh, modifiers of numerals. So at least three, uh, more than three, and so on. Uh, because uh, as some of you might know. There, there has been a, um, a quite extensive uh, debate about these modified numerals in over the last, well, almost ten years, and, and, and pragmatics. Uh, if you look at a sentence like John had at least has at least four kids, then Manfred Krivka, uh, and I think this is sort of basically the earliest. Mm -hmm. Uh, reference here has noticed that if um, we think of scalar implicatures uh, to be derived by negating uh, relevant alternatives to uh, a given assertion, and then we might expect that John has at least four kids would come out as meaning that John has exactly four kids, because. A relevant alternative to John has at least four kids would be John has, a, has, a, has at least five kids, right? And John has at least five kids is a stronger statement that you could make. It entails that John has at least four kids. Whenever John has at least five kids, he must also have at least four, we would think. However, we do not find this, right? This, this, this inference is absent from that sentence. It does not have, John has at least four kids does not have the scalar implicature that John has exactly four kids, right? However, there are other types of inferences to come with at least. So um, if I say I have at least two kids, it's a bit odd. Right? It suggests that I don't really know how many kids I have. Similarly, uh, when I say a hexagon has at most eight sides, it has six. That's also strange. And why is it strange? Well, intuitively speaking, right? uh, the first part seems to convey that I don't know how many, how many sides uh, a hexagon has, and then I'm stating, well, but I actually do know because it has exactly six. And that's quite contradictory in, in a way to say something like this. And similarly, if I say, trust me, I know how big this apartment is. It has at least 40 square meters. There might be contexts where this is fine, but out of the blue, this doesn't seem very co a very coherent statement. And again, if I if I ask you to trust me because I know exactly how big this apartment is, and then I say, well, it's at least 40, then there's again something contradictory going on here. Okay? And the, this fact has been taken to suggest that at least comes with a, um, an obligatory uncertainty inference, that the speaker is not certain what exactly is the case. Right? Now. Let's come to the other. So, so, so there are two things, right? At least does not have a scalar implicatures, but it has uncertainty 
inferences, or sometimes called uncertainty implicators. Let's look to the other side of the debate. A more than, similarly like, to at least, seems to not carry a scalar implicators. Namely, when I say, John has more than four kids, under the same reasoning as before, John has more than five kids would be a stronger possible statement that I could make. Whenever John has more than five kids, he also has more than four. Thereby, by Gricean reasoning, you might expect that given that I've said John has more than four kids, it's not true that John has more than five kids, there, which means that he has exactly four kids. Because if he has more than four, but not more than five, he must have exactly four. Again, this is not what the sentence means. Right? So we would, we would think that both types of modifiers of numerals, the at least modifiers and the, mo the more than modifiers, do not give rise to scale implicatures and they should be... So the next question to ask is, does more than similarly not have... Does more than similarly to at least come with obligatory, obligatory uncertainty inferences? Because if that's the case, then we would think, well, they're pretty much the same, right? I mean, they mean something else, but the general analysis should be, should be the same. The problem is, this doesn't seem to be the case. If I say I have more than two kids, that's a perfectly coherent statement in certain contexts, right? Or a hexagon has, has fewer than eight sides, it has six. There is no oddness about this. Uh, right? Compare this to a hexagon has at least, uh, has at most eight sides, it has six, which was strange, but this here is fine. Similarly, I, similarly if I say, trust me, I know how big this apartment is, it has more than 40 square meters, perfectly fine. Right. So more than does not seem to come with obligatory uncertainty inference, says, whereas at least seems to do. Right. So the, 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 the general conclusion that is, that is drawn in the literature, as far as we are aware, is that superlative modifiers, like at least, I call them superlative because they seem to have a superlative morphology built in, uh, come with an obligatory un uncertainty component. Uh, Whereas comparative modifiers do not. They don't have this uncertainty component. Now, that mean, and, and moreover, that is taken to mean that more than, even though it has, does not have scalar implicatures, uh, it should be analyzed differently from at least, in the sense that more than has a simple semantics, probably along the lines that all of us here would expect. However, superlative modifiers are a real conundrum. Because this uncertainty inference must be derived from something. Since it's not part of more than, it shouldn't be derived by, a, let's, by, let's say, general pragmatic mechanisms. It should be part of the semantics. That's the usual conclusion, right? And, the, and part of the semantics means, some people say it's, it's part of a mode, there's a modal component in there, or some people say we should go to completely different compositional semantics. For, for superlative modifiers and, and things like that. Our claim is that this is not the complete picture. Um, namely, when we consider utterances of more than in, 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 in specific contexts, uncertainty does seem to arise. Namely, when I say, how many kids do you have? Or you ask me, how many kids do, do you have? And I answer, I have more than three kids somehow strange again, right? It's, it's, it seems like either I'm mis trying to mislead you somehow or, or be evasive or what, or it seems to suggest that I don't know how many kids I have. Right? So there is the uncertainty. That's context of type one. A context of type two, where uncertainty does not arise, we claim would be one like this. Imagine you're uh, uh, at some office and, 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 the, and the clerk there asks you, I need to double check if you qualify for these benefits. Do you have three kids? And then, I said, yes, I have more than three kids. That's perfectly fine. And here, there is no uncertainty, right? I can say, yes, I have more than three kids, because the only thing that's relevant is what I have three or more than, th or, or less than three, actually, right? Uh, in other words, uh, in, in, in types of, in, we, we claim that in, in those types of contexts, like context two, that's the types of context where uncertainty does not arise with more than. But in, types, in, in contexts like type one, uncertainty will arise, contrary to what, what has been claimed in the literature. Now let's see this more clearly. Uh, imagine, 
let's, let's focus in on context one. Uh, someone asks, what, what is the distance between Ramallah and Jerusalem? And then uh, A answers, hmm, it's more than 10 kilometers. This does seem to suggest that the speaker is not quite sure how, ma how, how many kilometers it is, but it, it's definitely more than 10, right? 11, 12, 15, whatever. Similarly, in that type of context, when I say it's at least 10 kilometers, again, the speaker is not sure what it is, but the lowest bound, the lower bound that, that, this, that the speaker considers possible is 10. Right? So again, in this type of context, both at least and more than have uncertainty. We think, therefore, that uncertainty should be derived in, in, in a general way, as a, as a pragmatic inference. And once this has been done, we will come back to contexts of type 2, where more than does not deliver uh, uh, uncertainty. Right? So sum up, right? So far. Superlative modifiers never give rise to scale implicatures. Um, they, however, always give rise to uncertainty. And comparative modifiers never give rise to scale implicature, they but they sometimes give rise to uncertainty. Okay. Uh, what we will try to do is we will argue for an implicature based account of these inferences. Uh, basically, along the lines that, that I've independently suggested and also. Uh, Bernhard Schwartz has suggested, and earlier, though very different, uh, in a very different way, Daniel Buring has suggested. Uh, however, there always remain the cer certain problems, certain problems, uh, which um, we will attempt to solve here. And the idea is that the absence of the scalar of the scalar implicature inference, both with at least and more than, is tightly connected to the presence or absence of uncertainty inferences. That is, the uncertainty implicature arises when a scalar implicature does not arise. So they're kind of in complementary distribution. It's not quite, not quite right, but for a moment. And that means, we will, and, and, and to derive this, we will argue for a very specific type of a semantic pragmatic interface, uh, where this, with an interesting division of labor. And in order to, 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 to be able to do so, to, to, to make this work, we will, we will show that, or we will argue, that the notion of alternative, that is, alternative utterances that a speaker might make, uh, has to re be revisited and has to be made, has to be made very pre precise. The actual reason for this is, as you will later see, that this part of the, this is only one part of the at least more than uh, problem. There is a whole other problem which has to do with the co-occurrence of those modified numerals with uh, modals, which is a, a very confusing uh, empirical field. So we will first focus on uh, modified numerals without any models inside, and then we will bring them in. These models. Okay. Um, okay. So let's let's consider. We will first um, what the theoretical framework is that we will be assuming. Uh, I try to be, uh, yeah, um, very. Uh, uh, well. Not too technical, let's see. So uh, we will say that this will later on be modified, but we will say that at least and more than have a very simple semantics. Uh, th this, very, this very simple semantics can get us a, a long way, we will we'll find out, but not all the way. Uh, in particular, at least a statement like at le John has at least three kids means there is a p potentially plural individual uh, which has the cardinality of three or higher that John has, and it's, and it's kids, right? Uh, and similar more than means, more than, John has more than three kids, is that there is a potentially plural individual that is larger than three, whose cardinality is larger than three, sorry, and those are kids, 
And John has those kids, and they're kids of John's, in other words. And John has three kids. <coughs> Simply means that there is a that there is a, a, a maximal in, in unique. There's a unique individual with the cardinality of exactly three, such that they are kids of John. So, in other words, John has exactly three kids. Um, so, we will start with this. Um, and in the background, I haven't said anything about at most and few of them, right? Which are the the negative uh, versions of at least and more than. Uh, for for the moment, we will assume they are simply negations of that. Tur it will turn out that that's not quite right, but for the moment, that's fine. Okay, now. There has been a, a lot. Uh, there has been a, a big debate about um, how the semantics pragmatics division should be should be framed in in recent years. Uh, we will make an argument here that scalar implicatures are derived in the semantics, whereas the pragmatics derives uncertainty implicatures, uncertainty inferences which are weaker than scale implicatures, as we will see. In particular, when you say, when there's a, when you make, uh, let, 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 let's make this precise by considering this junction. This junction is the, is the like, like, like one of these cases that's very often discussed. When, you, when I say something like A or B, John, John drinks wine or John drinks beer, right? The, 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 the basic meaning of such a disjunction is, is that of an inclusive disjunction. It doesn't say that John doesn't drink both. Could be that he drinks both. Right? It just says that one of these is true, at least. Um, now, we basically assume that there are two possible syntactic structures available for such a sentence. Namely, the plain one over here, which will give you, in the semantics, this inclusive meaning that I just talk talked about. Plus one where you have an operator on top here. Oh, here. This is an exhaustive operator which is similar in, semantics, in, in its semantics to, to, to uh, overt only. In the sense that it excludes certain or negates certain alternatives. In particular, the semantics of the exhaustification of A or B relative to a set of alternatives is the assertion of A or B, that must be true because I'm saying it, plus the negation of all innocently excludable alternatives to A or B. Now what are the innocently excludable alternatives? It's, it's, fairly, it's, it's fairly easy to see. I, I, I will show you this in a second. An, inno innocent, an alternative can be negated if it is in the intersection of all those maximal sets Alpha 1, alpha 2, blah, 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 such that when I negate all of them, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and conjoin them with the assertion phi, I do not get a contradiction. What, me, what does it mean? Consider our sentence, John or Mary called, a disjunction, right? And we have, an, we, have an we have an exhaustive operator on top, which is similar to only. It's, a, so it's supposed to say something like, it's only the case that John or Mary called. The alternatives to the sentence for now are John called, Mary called, or John and Mary called, right? The simple disjuncts plus the conjunction. All of them are logically stronger than the disjunction. If John called, it must be the case that John or Mary called. If John and Mary called, it of course it must be the case that one of them called. Now, since we're trying to see what the exhaustification of that sentence is, we have to ask ourselves, what are the maximally excludable alternatives? Well, there's two ways you could go. You're, since we're saying that John or Mary called, we could negate John called. We could neg negate John and Mary ca called. What would be the outcome? Well, if I'm saying that John or Mary called, but it's not the case that John called, then it must be the case that Mary called. Right? of the negation of this. Adding to this, the negation of Mary called would be a contradiction. I can't say John or Mary called, but John didn't call and Mary didn't call. Right? So this is 
this is the sense of a maximally excludable set of alternatives. It's that set where as soon as you add one more alternative and negate it, you get a contradiction. Right? So this is maximal. This is also maximal, right? I could say John or Mary called, but Mary didn't call. And it's not the case that John or Mary called. That would end up being saying that John called. Right? Again, you can't add the negation of Mary called to this. And now, the innocently excludable alternative turns out to be just John and Mary called. Because it's in both sets. It's the only alternative that is in both sets. And it's the intuition behind this that it is the only alternative such that when you negate it and assert John or Mary called, it does not force the truth of another alternative. So, right, let's think mo once more. If I say John or Mary called and I negate John called, then I force the truth of Mary called. Vice versa, if I say John or Mary called and negate Mary called, then I force the truth of John called. Right? So the, the negation of one forces the inclusion of another one. With John and Mary called, however, that's not the case. So therefore, it's innocently excludable. That's why it's in both sets, essentially, right? Formally. This is just a way to make this, this intuition precise, formally. And the resulting meaning is just the exclusive disjunction. John or Mary called, but not both. Right? So this is what the semantics does. Let's assume this for, for a moment, right? Uh, it, it negates the, those alternatives that it can negate. That means that after we've exhaustified, we get the exclusive meaning for or. If we don't exhaustify, we, 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 we stick with the inclusive meaning in the semantics. And then both of them could be sent to the pragmatics, of course. I mean, just one is going to be sent to pragmatics because usually we don't utter two things twice, but one of them, right? And then the pragmatics does whatever what, what pragmatics is assumed to do. Following basically Grice, we assume a co cooperative speaker, right? Let's let's quickly um, remind our, ourselves what what that essentially means. It says that in a given context and two sentences, phi and psi, the speaker should choose psi over phi as an assertion if the following holds. Phi and psi are both relevant in the context. Psi asymmetrically entails phi. So it's a stronger statement, more informative. Psi is an alternative. It's not just any type of sentence, right? And the speaker is more, moreover certain that both phi and psi are true. In that case, he should choose psi. If he nevertheless chooses phi, then we, draw, then we as hearers draw the conclusion that the speaker is not certain that psi holds, okay? which is this. And that's essentially the ignorance, the uncertainty inference, right? If you're not certain what a, what a psi holds, then you are, well, you're uncertain. <laughs> Okay, so uncertainty inferences are derived in the pragmatics. Scalar implicatures are derived in the semantics. Um, and now we will show what this does for at least, right, and, and more than. Let's come back to our actual um, puzzle. We must make one more thing precise. I've already, you, you remember when I said John or Mary, uh, what was it, smokes or something, right? We said that uh, a, uh, the alternatives to that sentence are not just that John and, are not just the conjunction like John and Mary smokes, but also the simple disjuncts. John smokes and the other disjunct, Mary smokes. And how, how do these disjuncts come in there, right? With, with a simple grice, or basically, uh, what, what, what uh, Larry Horn suggested was that or and and form scalar alternatives. But it has, been become, it has become clear through the work of Sauerland and other people and then Katzir and Fox and Katzir that we also want the disjuncts in there for, for, for more complex disjunctions. And the re so we need to restate the, dis the, 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 uh, the, the alternative, how should I say that? Uh, the, the algorithm that derives alternatives. And the way we do this is by saying that 
The alternatives of a sentence phi are those sentences psi, which can be derived from phi by these two ways. Namely, by substitution of a node in phi with an element from the lexicon, or by substitution of a node in phi with a subconstituent of phi itself. What does it mean? I, I've shown this here for at least, right? Consider at least two. This is the node V here. The first case where I substitute with a, an element from the lexicon, I could, for instance, go and substitute two with three, thereby deriving the alternative at least three. But I could also go and substitute the whole node V uh, with a with a with with something from the lexicon V four, right? But there's also something else allowed. I could take this node, the subnode, and substitute it for the whole thing, which would be equivalent in that case to taking something from the lexicon out. But I can take I, ha I have. I have, I have the liberty to take something from the structure, so to speak. And this is what, what, we, what we saw with the disjunction, right? When I had John or Mary smokes, I took one disjunct and replaced it for the whole thing, thereby deriving John smokes. And John smokes is not a, is, is not, is not a lexical item. So I, I have to take this from, this is, this is the way why we assume that syntax uh, gives us uh, alternatives, right? Okay, and now we're basically there. This means that for at least three, we get alternatives of the form at least four, at least five, but also exactly three, exactly four, exactly five. And similarly for more than, we actually get more alternatives, but these are the ones that are relevant. Right? More than four, more than five, exactly four, exactly five, and so on. And now, remember, we want to do, we want to do two things. Well, actually three, but first we want to do two things. We want to first explain why scalar implicatures are absent with at least and more than. Then we want to derive why uncertainty inferences are there with both. And then later on we want to show that uncertainty inferences are not always there with more than right? and why that is the case. So in order to show why scalar implicatures are not there, we have to consider the exhaustification of a sentence like John had at least five beers. Why? Because we said that the scale implications are derived in the semantics, right? So what does it mean? So here he, he gets complicated. Uh, if is everyone with me so far, or or not? I, I don't know. I'm not seeing people. You can ask questions, right? Remember. Um, once you've so this is one of the most crucial points. Uh, once you've seen the logic, uh, I think it's 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 fairly intuitive. The alternatives we've just we've just shown the alternatives for John had, under these assumptions, right? For John had at least five beers are things like John had at least six beers, John had at least seven beers, John had exactly five beers, he had exactly six beers, and things like that, right? Which is also intuitive in a way, but now we have to see which of these alternatives can can be negated, but by, by our only like operator, the exhaustive operator. And for this to, and the way we do this is by seeing what are the maximally consistent alternatives that we can negate, and and, and list all these sets. It turns out this the set this, this is an infinite set of there's an infinite number of such sets. Right? When I'm saying John had at least five, five beers, I could, for instance, negate John had at least six beers. I could negate. Has exactly six. I couldn't negate it as at least seven, and so on. What what would be the what would be the outcome? It would mean because of the assertion that John had had at least five beers, and I'm negating that he has at least six, that he had exactly five. Right? This is the implicature that we started out with and said this sentence does not have this implicature. Now notice from this set. Sorry, from this set. Um, We've left, left out one crucial alternative, namely the alternative that John had exactly five beers. And in fact, we couldn't add it here because we've just I, I've just told you, right, with this set, we get the, the meaning that John has exactly, had exactly five beers. If we added it, we would be negating it and we would derive a contradiction, so we can't add it. But what we can do is we can start another set and take out John had at least six beers and John had exactly six beers. 
What we are now saying, what we now arrive at, is that John had at least five, but he hadn't exactly five. He hadn't <coughs> at least seven. He didn't have at least seven, and so on. In other words, he had exactly six. Right? Let's go through one more step. Now, I could take out the at least seven alternative and the exactly seven alternative and put back in the six alternatives, right? What I would be saying then is that John had at least five beers. He didn't have exactly five. He didn't have at least six. He didn't have exactly six, right? but he didn't have at least eight either. That means he had exactly seven. And then I go on like this, right? Well, I mean, now, which alternative is in all of these sets? Well, none. Really? There is none. Uh, this is the crucial, this, this is the solution to the puzzle, right? Uh, if, you don't, if you don't do it this way, you can still derive the facts, but it, for, for this simple case, but we will not derive it in other cases. That's, that's the problem. That's why we go through this complicated solution here which has been argued to be accurate in other ways. That means, okay, so, so I, should, I, should, I, I should state what, what the outcome is more clearly. There is no, these, these sets do not share a member. So that means the exhaustive operator, or only, the covert only, let's call it, cannot negate anything. That means exhaustification is vacuous, there is no scalar implicature, and John had at least five Ps just means what the semant what, what the, the lexical semantics gives us, namely that John had five beers or more. Right? So first step is derived. The same outcome is derived for John had more than five beers. Right? We would just be replacing uh, this non-strict comparison with strict comparison that lifts everything one step up, but it's exactly the same. Now we want to derive, on the other hand, that when scalar implicatures are not there, that we get, the inf that, that we get in uncertainty inferences. And remember, we said these are derived in the pragmatics. So we've seen that John, the, the exhaustification of John had at least five peers means he had five or more. Now, since we're operating in the assumption that the, the speaker is cooperative, there is now a You, as a hearer of that sentence, will ask yourself, why didn't the speaker say that John had exactly five beers? Why didn't he say that John had at least six beers? Or exactly six. These are all more informative, as we've determined, right? Since he didn't say that, the speaker must be uncertain about them. Right? That means he doesn't, he doesn't believe that this is true. He doesn't believe that this is true. Right? And we have the uncertainty inference. Right? So the outcome is, after the pragmatics, that John had at least five years means John had five or more. That's what the speaker is certain about. But he's not certain what the number above five is, such a, or uh, from five on, such that John has had that period. It could be six, could be seven, five, whatever. And similarly, for, for more than, right? Exactly the same conclusion. So this is good. Given the way we, we define the alternatives, um, the exhaustification of an unembedded super, superlative modifier that means without any models or anything is vacuous. Uh, given the constant set of alternatives as we've defined it, unembedded superlative modifiers will, however, give rise to uncertainty implicatures, and obligatorily so, if we don't say anything further. And even once we've said anything further. Right? The question is, right, remember, now we have to come back to our, our, our old question. Why do comparative mod modifiers not give rise to uncertainty in all cases? Remember, so, so let, let, let's recap it. Re, re, uh, yes. Yes, nearly right, but uh, I was actually looking for another word. Uh, Let's remind ourselves of the facts that we start out with. I wanted to say re recapitulate, and then I thought that's actually not the right word. Uh, so 
in a context where someone asks, how much is it? How, how much does it cost? Right? Something like that. Uh, uh, and, so, and someone, uh, the the address C answers, it's more than it's more than ten. Or it costs more than ten. Uh, costs at least ten. We, we've seen it both more than and at least have uncertainty. This is what we've derived. That's good. This is what no one else has derived in their account because everyone else tries to have more than at least strictly separate. What we have not derived is why in a context where, where someone says, how much is it? Uh, is it 10? And someone answers, it's more than 10. Why well, there is no uncertainty. Because at, at the moment, we predict uncertainty all over the place. And this is good for at least, because there's still uncertainty, but not with more than, as we've seen. So what is, I, I will give you the intuition behind it. I think there's, I mean, this is, is a very, um, well, it's not an easy, not an easy problem, right? Uh, again, it has to do with the alternatives that, that are relevant. In a context where someone says, how much is it? Is it 10? We basically want to say that the only, we, the only alternatives that are actually relevant are the ones that you see there. 10, more than 10, right? More than 10 because it's in, in the assertion of it's more than 10. 10 also because it's in the context, right? Someone asks, is it 10? That is, while we so far in our computations assume this huge set of structural alternatives that you, you, you generate, um, in particular context, you act, of course restrict these alternatives, right? We, we don't, we don't, we don't, when I ask you, is it 10, you don't bother thinking about a million, right? Or something like that, usually. Um, and now the claim is, or what we, want to, what we want to say is that this restriction of the set of relevant alternatives is actually licensed with the, when, 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 when you're uttering more than 10, but not in the case of at least 10. Um, um, the reason, now we have to ask why. Right? Yeah, there has been, again, th this is formalized again here in a maybe not so <laughs> clear way at the beginning, but the intuition behind is out there, they're, they're very, I think they're, they're, they're fairly clear and they have been around. Um, so the first, the first part is found in literature all over the place. The second part we added, but I, we, will, we will give them, we'll, we, we will defend uh, the second uh, condition on independent, for independent reasons. So there is a conditional alternative pruning. That's basically an, a condition that says when you can restrict the set of alter, all alternatives to a set of a potential set of a restricted alternatives, right? And it says that when you have a structure or a sentence phi, the alternatives of phi that you derive automatically in the way that we, that we talked about, they can be pruned to a subset of that set only if one and two hold. First, there is no distinct alternative, psi, that is in the original set, such that the exhaustification of phi with respect to the new set is identical to psi. That means the intuition is it's complicated, complicated state, but the intuition is don't do via, via scalar implicature what you could do via an overt assertion of some, some alternative, right? Essentially, that's, that's what it says. Um, and that, that intuition is around all over, the, all, all over the place. It's also found in NPI literature. And so. The second intuition that we want to add here is that all the alternatives in the original set that are, that are, that are part of the sentence that we utter, so to speak, they must be in the, in, the, in, 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 in the smaller set. So when I say it's more than 10, an alternative life, like it's exactly 10, must still, must still remain because I've uttered more than 10, so I've thereby made relevant, basically, it's exactly 10. It's an alternative. But you can get rid of other alternatives, right? So what does this do? Oh, why, 
why the second so okay this first part uh, has been has been argued for the second part I think we need four independent reasons anyway let's let's make a step back once more to, to this junction if I say John or Mary called and then I say namely John that's very strange right why utter the disjunction and then utter something like that well it should be good if we could restrict our set of alternatives like John called Mary called John and Mary called to simply John and Mary called. That's basically the, the, the old horn alternative. Namely, when I say John and Mary called, and then I exhaustify and, and get not John and Mary called, why not add, namely, John? There's nothing that, that prohibits that, right? That means, in other words, that the uncertainty inference that we found with or seems to be as obligatory as the uncertainty inference with at least. And that's for a particular reason, right? Namely for, 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 for the fact that you can't get rid of alternatives that are so to speak, given to you by the very fact that you are asserting a disjunction. And that would be an alternative like John called and also an alternative like Mary called. Okay. So let's see what, what this does for, for more than 10 and at least 10. Um, remember, the, the, the relevant contexts are contexts of type 2, where someone asks, how much is it? Is it 10? And then you answer, it's more than 10. We assume there's uh, exhaustification here. We know that the alternatives are more than 10, more than 11, more than 12, exactly 10, exactly 11, and so on. And we ask ourselves, can we restrict this set of alternatives to that smaller one, where there's just 10 and more than 10 in it? Well, why not? Uh, the only alternative that I actually, from this set, that I could negate is 10, right? Because I, more than 10 is asserted, so I can't negate it. Uh, so let's do that. That means it's more than 10, but it's not exactly 10. Well, that's already entailed by the assertion that there is more than 10. So you get back, it's more than 10. Mean, exhaustification, in other words, is vacuous with respect to that smaller set. Okay. Now, that means that nothing here is violated in our condition on pruning. First, since we get back the, the meaning that we, had, that we had without exhaustification, it's not, the resulting meaning is not equivalent to some other distinct alternative in the set, right? It's more than 10 is not equivalent to it's more than 11 or ex exactly 10 or exactly 11. So that's good, the first part. The second part, or the second subcondition that is not violated is that in this smaller set, we have all the set, all the alternatives in there that we can derive from its more than 10 by simply replacing more than 10 with subconstituents. Right? We can go and replace more than 10 with 10. So that part is also not violated. Okay, that, in other words, cut a long, long story short, we are allowed to restrict a set of alternatives, thereby, for, for more than 10, thereby not derive a scalar implicature, which is a, as we want, but in addition also not derive an uncertainty inference. Essentially, you do, you do not derive the uncertainty inference here because there are no relevant alternative, alter, alternatives left, basically. That's the idea. Now, consider at least. Again, in the context where someone says, how much is it? Is it 10? And then you answer, it's at least 10. Th the intuition is, first of all, it's maybe not so good, this, this answer. Second, the, the uncertainty inference doesn't go away, right? Very clearly. So we have to ask ourselves, again, can we restrict this set of alternatives to the smaller set, as with more than 10? Well, again, with it, we could, but now we get a problem, namely, the only alternative that we can negate by exhaustification is 10, because at least 10 is uttered, so I can't neg negate it. it, would be a contradiction. If I say, if however, I say at least 10, but not exactly 10, what does that mean? It means at it's at least 11, right? So the exhaustification of it's at least 10 with respect to the smallest set gives you a meaning that you could have expressed by taking an alternative without exhaustification, namely it's a, at least 11. And this goes via the first part of the condition on pruning, right? 
don't do via exhaustification what you could do by just making something, by making a stronger statement with an overt uh, meaning, so to speak. Okay, so we've derived this, right? Or so it seems that we do not get, we, we cannot prune the set of alternatives with at least 10 to the smallest set. And thereby, we don't get an uncertain inference. But hey, wait a minute, you might ask now, right? This was, this was a trick, right? Uh, namely, <laughs> this only worked because of the context that I gave you, right? How much, how much is it? Is it 10? And then I said, it's at least 10. But what if I said, is it 9? And you answered, it's at least 10. That's, first of all, a good answer. Second, it still has the uncertainty. Huh? And now, the, you might ask yourself now, right, if we restricted the set of alternatives to at least 9, 9, at least 10. I don't know about at least 9, but definitely 9 is in there, right? Because it's it made relevant here in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the question. And then we ask ourselves, well, when we now exhaustify, it's at least 10 with respect to the smaller set. What do we get? We can't negate it's at least 9, because at least 10 entails at least 9. But we can negate exactly 9. Right? You, you with me? We can negate exactly 9. Saying it's, a, it's, and that would mean that when we negate exactly 9, that we get back it's at least 10. Because if it's at least 10, it, it by, 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 by the very meaning of it's at least 10, it can, it can, can't be 9, right? So, it would seem that exhaustification in that case is again um, vacuous, as, as with more than. And therefore, we should be able to restrict our set to this, this smaller set. and not get an uncertainty inference with at least. However, this violates another, the second condition on, on, on pruning. This is why we have the second condition, right? Because it's crucial that for, for this to work, that in this set we left out the alternative exactly 10. And we say, well, you don't just restrict your set of alternatives to the ones that are mentioned in the, in, 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 in the preceding discourse. You also must carry those along that are sort of made relevant by making a assumption, uh, by making an assertion, like uh, it's at least 10. On that makes relevant exactly 10. So you can't actually, you will never have this set. And then we're done. Because this is, then, then, then we have all, as far as I can see, all the contexts where at least 10 might not have an uncertainty inference and we've taken care of them by the condition and proning. So, so what does it mean? What is the result? Um, Insert in, in, in context where someone asks, how many children do you have? Both the unembedded comparative and the unembedded superlative modifiers uh, do not give rise to scale implicatures according to this account, but they give rise to uncertainty inferences. Right? And we have, we've derived this in a principled way. Um, however, in the second type of context, namely where someone asks, do you have 10 children? Only the comparative modifiers allows restriction of the set of alternatives that get, that get, that get exhaustified, so to speak. And therefore, only, only the comparative modifier uh, can ever show up without an uncertain inference. Right. So this is this way of thinking, so, so let, let, let's, step, let's step back for a second or so. Um, why, why do this that way? Well, if we hadn't shown, no, oh, sorry. How should I say this? Con consider, con consider, I have not given you alternative views on this, really. I mean, I haven't discussed them in detail, right? But I, I said that so far people take at least three, and more than three, to be 
completely different animals. This could be, right? But that casts doubt, that would, if that were the case, it would, would, would cast significant doubt on an, an, an approach to the uncertainty inference coming with at least that is based on such a general mechanism like pragmatics. So what people had to do was, well, okay, more than doesn't have certain alternatives uh, by, le by lexical stipulations, but that gets you into trouble right? in the certain cases, as I will we'll show in a minute. So by having shown that empirically you do get actually uncertain the inferences with more than when you look carefully, we've given evidence, we've given support to the view that uh, both at least and more than should allow for a derivation of uncertainty by a principal pragmatic me pragmatic mechanism, so to speak. Right. And then we only try to show that in certain cases these go away. No, I don't know. Uh, We've, 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 we've essentially now <laughs> only that, than, than, than the groundwork that allows us to go into the, the puzzle, the puzzles that everyone in working in this area is, is really interested in. And that, that has to do with the combinations of other, of, of, of modified numerals and other uh, uh, logical elements like modals. And, and in particular, and the things are there, the, 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 the empirical picture there is so complicated that it has not, it's basically not clear whether you can do this, uh, derive the right meanings, the, the attested meanings, with uh, what, what, what we've um, set out to do here. But I mean, the time is a bit, I don't know, how much time do I have? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I can also. The question is, right? I can maybe give you a uh, like a five-minute version of. Well, not a version. I, I won't go through all this. I give, give you a five-minute version of the because we started a little late anyway, right? So I, I give you like a, a five-minute version of uh, a hint of, of what what the puzzle is. And I will not talk about fewer than and at most. Right? I mean, I, we have something interesting to say, and you can ask questions uh, about them, but there are they're, they're things there get complicated. So let's, let's start with an observation. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, an observation about, about a fact that follows from, from what I've said. When we have a modal co-occurring with, with, uh, with, with a modified numeral, like uh, John must drink at least three beers, let's say. Then there is, in principle, two structures available, right? At least you can either scope the modal above, uh, the modal modified numeral above the modal or below it. Right? However, given the fact that when the modal, the mo sorry, the modified numeral scopes above the modal, it is so to speak, unembedded, as it, once again, we will derive for this case exactly the, the, the exactly the, the the facts that we've derived so far, right? As even if there as if there was no modal there, that means that in all of these cases where the modal has white scope, not the modal, the modified numeral, but a modified numeral has white scope, the exhaustification will be vacuous. We don't get a scale implicature, and there will always be an uncertainty inference except for these uh, little tweakings with more than that we've seen, right? However, when the modified numeral takes scope below the modal, well, we don't know. Things might be very different. Um, and we will see that exhaustification there is not always vacuous. That means you do get a scale implicature. But by our, by our initial Hypothesis that also means that the uncertainty implication goes away because they're in a bind complementary distribution, right? So let's let's see that. I told you we would modify a bit the semantics for for uh, the modified numerals. 
uh, in particular, for at least three, we, or at least, right, we, we say, we, we, we assume a degree semantics. That means at least three uh, says there is a degree such that the degree is. There, there has been, again, this, this is formalized again here in a maybe not so clear way at the beginning, but the intuition behind this, they're, they're, they're very, I think they're, they're, they're fairly clear and they have been around. Um, so the first, the first part is found in literature all over the place. The second part we added, but I, we, will, we will give more, we, we, we will defend uh, the second uh, condition on independ for independent reasons. So there is a conditional alternative pruning. It's basically an, a condition that says when you can restrict the set of alter all alternatives to a set of a potential set of a restricted alternatives, right? And it says that when you have a structure or a sentence phi, the alternatives of phi that you derive automatically in the way that we, that we talked about, they can be pruned to a subset of that set only if one and two hold. First, there is no distinct alternative, psi, that is in the original set, such that the exhaustification of phi with respect to the new set is identical to psi. That means the intuition is it's complicated, complicated state, but the intuition is don't do via, via scalar implicature what you could do via an overt assertion of some, some alternative, right? Essentially, that's, that's what it says. Um, and that, that intuition is around all over, the, all, all over the place. It's also found in NPI literature. And so. The second intuition that we want to add here is that all the alternatives in the original set that are, that are, that are part of the sentence that we utter, so to speak, they must be in the, in, the, in, 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 in the smaller set. So when I say it's more than 10, an alternative life like it's exactly 10 must still, must still remain because I've uttered more than 10, so I've thereby made relevant, basically, it's exactly 10. It's an alternative. But you can get rid of other alternatives, right? So what does this do? Oh, why, why the second, so, okay, this first part uh, has been has been argued for the second part. I think we need four independent reasons anyway. Let's let's make a step back once more to, to this junction. If I say John or Mary called, and then I say namely John, that's very strange. Right? Why utter the disjunction and then utter something like that? Well, it should be good if we could restrict our set of alternatives like John called, Mary called, John and Mary called, to simply John and Mary called. That's basically the, the, the old horn alternative. Namely, when I say John and Mary called, and then I exhaustify and, and get not John and Mary called, why not add namely John? There's nothing that, that prohibits that, right? That means, in other words, that the uncertainty inference that we found with or seems to be as obligatory as the uncertainty inference with at least. And that's for a particular reason, right? Namely for, 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 for the fact that you can't get rid of alternatives that are so to speak, given to you by the very fact that you are asserting a disjunction. And that would be an alternative like John called and also an alternative like Mary called. Okay. So let's see what, what this does for, for more than 10 and at least 10. Um, remember, the, the, the relevant contexts are contexts of type 2, where someone asks, how much is it? Is it 10? And then you answer, it's more than 10. We assume there's uh, exhaustification here. We know that the alternatives are more than 10, more than 11, more than 12, exactly 10, exactly 11, and so on. And we ask ourselves, can we restrict this set of alternatives to that smaller one, where there's just 10 and more than 10 in it? Well, why not? Uh, the only alternative that I actually, from this set, that I could negate is 10, right? Because I, more than 10 is asserted, so I can't negate it. Uh, so let's do that. 
That means it's more than 10, but it's not exactly 10. Well, that's already entailed by the assertion that there is more than 10. Right? So you get back, it's more than 10. Mean, exhaustification, in other words, is vacuous with respect to that smaller set. Okay. Now, that means that nothing here is violated in our condition on pruning. First, since we get back to the meaning that we had, that we had without exhaustification, it's not, the resulting meaning is not equivalent to some other distinct alternative in the set, right? It's more than 10 is not equivalent to it's more than 11 or ex exactly 10 or exactly 11. So that's good, the first part. The second part, or the second subcondition that is not violated is that in this smaller set, we have all the set, all the alternatives in there that we can derive from it's more than 10 by simply replacing more than 10 with subconstituents, right? We can go and replace more than 10 with 10. So that part is also not violated. Okay, that, in other words, to cut a long, long story short, we are allowed to restrict a set of alternatives, thereby, for, for more than 10, thereby not derive a scalar implicature, which is a, as we want, but in addition also not derive an uncertainty inference. Essentially, you do, you do not derive the uncertainty inference here because there are no relevant alternative, alter, alternatives left, basically. That's the idea. Now, consider at least. Begin in the context where someone says, how much is it? Is it 10? And then you answer, it's at least 10. Th the intuition is, first of all, it's maybe not so good, this, this answer. Second, the, the uncertainty inference doesn't go away, right? Very clearly. So we have to ask ourselves, again, can we restrict this set of alternatives to the smaller set, as with more than 10? Well, again, with it, we could. But now we get a problem. Namely, the only alternative that we can negate by exotification is 10. Because at least 10 is uttered, so I can't neg negate it. It would be a contradiction. If I say, if however, I say at least 10, but not exactly 10, what does that mean? It means at it's at least 11. Right? So the exotification of it's at least 10 with respect to the smallest set gives you a meaning that you could have expressed by taking an alternative without exhaustification, namely it's a, at least 11. And this goes via the first part of the condition on pruning, right? Don't do via exhaustification what you could do by just making something, by making a stronger statement with an overt uh, meaning, so to speak. Okay, so we've derived this, right? Or so it seems that we do not get, we, we cannot prune the set of alternatives with at least 10 to the smallest set. And thereby, we don't get an uncertain inference. But hey, wait a minute, you might ask now, right? This was, this was a trick, right? Uh, namely, <laughs> this only worked because of the context that I gave you, right? How much, how much is it? Is it 10? And then I said, it's at least 10. But what if I said, is it 9? And you answered, it's at least 10. That's, first of all, a good answer. Second, it still has the uncertainty. Huh? And now, the, you might ask yourself now, right, if we restricted the set of alternatives to at least 9, 9, at least 10. I don't know about at least 9, but definitely 9 is in there, right? Because it's it made relevant here in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the question. And then we ask ourselves, well, when we now exhaustify, it's at least 10 with respect to the smaller set. What do we get? We can't negate it's at least 9, because at least 10 entails at least 9. But we can negate exactly 9. Right? You, you with me? We can negate exactly 9. Saying it's, a, it's, and that would mean that when we negate exactly 9, that we get back it's at least 10. Because if it's at least 10, it, it by, 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 by the very meaning of it's at least 10, it can, it can, can't be 9, right? So it would seem that exhaustification in that case is, again, um, vacuous, as, as with more than. And therefore, we should be able to restrict our set to this, this smaller set. Okay. And not get an uncertainty inference with at least. 
However, this violates another, the second condition on, on, on pruning. This is why we have the second condition, right? Because it's crucial that for, for this to work, that in this set we left out the alternative exactly 10. And we say, well, you don't just restrict your set of alternatives to the ones that are mentioned in the, in, 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 in the preceding discourse. You also must carry those along that are sort of made relevant by making an assumption, uh, by making an assertion, like it's at least 10. On that makes relevant exactly 10. So you can't actually, you will never have this set. And then we're done. Because this is, then, then, then we have all, as far as I can see, all the contexts where at least 10 might not have an uncertainty inference, and we've taken care of them by the condition of pruning. So, so what does it mean? What is the result? Um, insert, in, in, in context where someone asks, how many children do you have? Both the unembedded comparative and the unembedded superlative modifiers uh, do not give rise to scale implicatures according to this account. But they give rise to uncertainty inferences. Right? And we have, we've derived this in a principled way. Um, however, in the second type of context, namely where someone asks, do you have 10 children? Only the comparative modifiers allows restriction of the set of alternatives that get, that get, that get exhaustified, so to speak. And therefore, only, only the comparative modifier uh, can ever show up without an uncertainty inference. Right. So this, this way of thinking, so, so let, let, let's step, let's step back for a second or so. Um, why, why do this that way? Well, if we hadn't shown... No, oh, sorry. How should I say it? Con consider, con consider, I have not given you alternative views on this really. I mean, I haven't discussed them in detail, right? But I, I said that so far people take at least three, and more than three, to be completely different animals. This could be, right? But that casts doubt, that would, if that were the case, it would, would, would cast significant doubt on an, an, an approach to the uncertainty inference coming with at least that is based on such a general mechanism like pragmatics. So what people had to do was, well, okay, more than doesn't have certain alternatives uh, by, le by lexical stipulations, but that gets you into trouble okay, in the certain cases, as I will we'll show in a minute. So by having shown that empirically you do get actually uncertain the inferences with more than when you look carefully, we've given evidence, we've given support to the view that uh, both at least and more than should allow for a derivation of uncertainty by a principal pragmatic me pragmatic mechanism, so to speak. Right. And then we only try to show that in certain cases these go away. No, I don't know. Uh, We've, 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 we've essentially now <laughs> only that, then, then, then the groundwork that allows us to go into the, the puzzle, the puzzles that everyone in working in this area is, is really interested in. And that, that has to do with the combinations of other, of, of, of modified numerals and other uh, uh, logical elements like modals. And, and in particular, and the things are there, the, 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 the empirical picture there is so complicated that it has not, it's basically not clear whether you can do this, uh, derive the right meanings, the, the attested meanings, with uh, what, what, what we've um, set out to do here. But I mean, the time is a bit, I don't know, 
How much time do I have? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I can also, the question is, right. I can maybe give you a, uh, like a five minute version of, well, not a version. I, I won't go through all this. I give, give you a five minute version of the, because we started a little late anyway, right? So I, I give you like a, a five minute version of uh, a hint of, of what, what the puzzle is. And I will not talk about fewer than and at most. Right? I mean, I, we have something interesting to say, and you can ask questions uh, about them, but they're, very, they're, they're things that get complicated. So let's, let's start with an observation. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, an observation about, about a fact that follows from, from what I've said. When we have a modal co-occurring with, with, uh, with, with a modified numeral, like uh, John must drink at least three beers, let's say, then there is, in principle, two structures available, right? At least you can either scope the modal above, uh, the modal modified numeral above the modal or below it. Right. However, given the fact that when the modal, the mo sorry, the modified numeral scopes above the modal, it is, so to speak, unembedded as it, once again, we will derive for this case exactly the, the, the exactly the, the, the facts that we've derived so far, right? As, even if there, as if there was no modal there. That means that in all of these cases where the modal has white scope, not the modal, the modified numeral, where the modified numeral has white scope, the exhaustification will be vacuous, we don't get a scale implicature, and there will always be an uncertainty inference, except for these uh, little tweakings with more than that we've seen, right? However, when the modified numeral takes scope below the modal, well, we don't know. Things might be very different. Um, and we will see that exhaustification there is not always vacuous. That means you do get a scale implicature. But by our, by our initial hypothesis, that also means that the uncertainty implicature goes away because they're in a complementary distribution, right? So let's, let's see that. I told you we would modify a bit the semantics for for uh, the modified numeral. Uh, in particular, for at least three, we, or at least, right, we, we say, we, we, we assume a degree semantics. That means at least three uh, says there is a degree such that the degree is. So, so, okay, so this is a very interesting question, right? Um, I think this is the. Maybe that's a, a slide. A relevant slide, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But if I say John had, had John read more than, why did I put the heading? John read more than 12 books. Uh, you might think, in, in certain, in, in, in easily constructible context, that doesn't mean that he did not read more than 20, right? While, while it still doesn't me, mean he did not read more than 13. So it seems that there is a, a, something to be said about the granularity of, of the alternatives that, 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 that play a role, right? And in most cases, well, we've sometimes talked about 10, so maybe there was not, well, maybe we've talked about children, so, and then things like that. How many kids do you have, right? There's always, the granularity is always the, the smallest one, so to speak. But, in certain cases, um, li like this, it seems that you're only considering the, 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 small, the, the, the smaller granularity, but you do, the, the, the scale implicature seems to re-emerge for coarser granularity, right? Um, and at the moment, we can only say that this, this is actually a huge problem for everyone, right? Who, who, who tries to derive this on, 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 on pragmatic terms. It, because it's not so clear how you... I'm not explaining this well. Uh, what, you would want, what you would like to say is... I can't, maybe, maybe I can... Can I write here? Is this for writing? Yeah. So if you have like, um, say, 
8, I've done this something before, 9, 6, 7, And you say, John, John read more than six, six books. Uh, you, you want, intuitively you would like to say, well, things that are relevant are, in, in, in this type of context that we're discussing here, are these very close numerals, right? Six, seven, eight, nine. But as soon as nine is relevant, why isn't 10 not relevant anymore? I mean, formally. How do you get rid of it? But once you have 10 relevant, how is 11 not relevant? It's not clear at all how you, how, how you can... So we would like to say, right, that when we, when, when we, when we make, when we assert, or in, in, a, in a given context, uh, a sentence with a, with, 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 with a, with, with, Without, without this coarse granularity, that alternatives that would correspond to the coarser granularity are simply not available. But it's not quite clear how, to me how to do that. There must be a way, but I, 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 sim I really don't know. So it's a very good question. Right. And that these uh, inferences do show up has actually also been shown uh, uh, experimentally by the people who we are citing here. And they also don't have, actually have an explanation for this. I think there was also. Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. I mean, why must there be a way? Why, why does this have to be. Okay, no, no. If, if we are right, <laughs> if, anything, like, if anything of the sort that, 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 that we are suggesting here, you don't even have to buy the complete picture, but if anything of the sort of an implicature based account for at least say at least, right, uh, is correct, then you would, would like to know when I say John had at least five beers, five, five beers, you draw the conclusion that he didn't... Have a million. Well, not even 20, right? We don't even have to go to these outrageous numbers. Uh, it's, but if you know John and you think they're going to believe this, and you know, it's going to be for every so... Of course, but probably he didn't have 50. Probably not, no. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is no matter how you slice it, that, that problem doesn't go easily away. There is a, a certain cutoff range, which will not be the same for everyone, right? So say, uh, we had this Ramallah Jerusalem case, right? And say, uh, someone doesn't know the ge geography of, Jerus uh, of, of Israel very well, right? Um, for instance, me, I have no idea. Really, uh, then uh, I mean I know it a bit. Then someone who says, well, "What? Who gets the answer? What's the distance?" Uh, and says it, 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 it's it's more than ten kilometers. Then easily, a person who knows Israel quite well, let's say, will draw the conclusion that it's probably not more than twenty-five or thirty. I don't know. But someone who who has no idea, really, about how, how large Israel is, or something. Isn't it, isn't it more context specific than that? Even if you're in Australia, yeah. you can ask, oh, how far is it to Alice Springs? And somebody says, it's more than 10 kilometers. That to me, that means, OK, probably I'm asking because I want to go there. And in order to go there, I have to hire a car, to buy petrol, and get some water. Yeah. So if you say more than 10, then I buy a bottle of water, because I know it will take me maybe half an hour to drive. Because then I'm going to assume it's maybe 10 or 15. But if it's like 2,000 kilometers, <coughs> then of your course. answer is irrelevant or misleading. No, no, of, of course, of, of course. Because I then make the. the yeah. And in a sense, you know. I, I was not meaning to suggest that. Uh, but so, so you, first of all, you're perfectly right that it's very context, things are very context dependent. But what I'm trying to say is. One, one person might be, in, when we stick to this uh, Israel case, might be an, considering alternatives of the, of the form 10, 15, 20, 25. The next type of, of, of person might consider alternatives of the form 10, 20, 30, 40. That means you predict 
a varying cutoff range of what the of what the higher limit is with these pe with with people, right? So what I'm what was I try what I was trying to say before was you don't expect that every that everyone will will, will assume that John didn't he didn't have more than twenty beers. People who know John very well might think, well, he might have actually had between twenty and twenty five because he is a big drink. But other people might not think so, right? So th that's all I was trying to say. Yeah. But you're right, things are very context dependent and certain things are never considered for certain reasons because they would not be practical, well, you, you, you would not be a cooperative speaker. You're right, in, in that case that you, dis, you discussed. Yeah. Uh, one question. Uh, sorry, uh, you know how many to go to Brazil in the 75th? <laughs> by, by, by at least two go. <laughs> <laughs> I go to seven. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there aren't any more uh, questions, I suggest that we perhaps put the, uh, the topic of discussion to the test um, and continue a more formal discussion at the, at the institute. At the institute. At least. Bar, um, for at least, at least, least one, yes. one yes. more. And thank Clemens once again for his talk. Thank you. Thank you.